What's up, guys? And thanks for watching our Holiday Cartridge Talks series. We are excited to bring you our first ever limited edition Vortex Nation podcast hoodie. If you're watching on YouTube, it's the one I'm wearing right now. Now, we only made 99 of these things. So when they're gone, they are gone. Click the link in the description to get yours. Thanks again, and enjoy the show. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to our Holiday Cartridge Talks series. Guys, this is the last one. Holy mackerel, sad day, but this is going to be a good one. This is like a grand finale. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, or if you're not, I'm going to tell you right now, Jim to my right, Mr. Ryan Muckenhorn across from us, and special guest. We've got a special guest for this one. We have Mr. Ian Clem, repeat guest, and uh, just always a fun one. The cartridge we're going to cover today is the 357 Remington Maximum. Never heard of it? You're going to hear about it now. Another, uh, also, point of order, another extra today. Ryan, we got a very nice letter and a gift the other day Yeah, that we nearly talked about on, we, a, diff on. on, on a different podcast, yep. but we thought it would be more fitting to today because it's... Uh, Number one, it's a very nice letter, and it's uh, it's car it's holiday cartridge season. It was like a, the the gift matched the theme of what we're doing today. I just like that this nice letter that Ryan brought along with him means that Ryan also brought pronounced to the podcast. Yeah, uh, that was, was a first? setup. <laughs> that was a setup. <laughs> Ryan's like, technically, these are not. I mean, I know they're printed. They were printed. I'm going to point out this isn't like a. I love all the emails, but this was like a letter that was sent to us. Yes. Via Mail. International mail. International mail. We've got an international baby. We do. Ooh. Do you want me to read it? Yeah, give it a okay. read. Okay. I'm going to go through. It's kind of long. It's four paragraphs, but I'll, I'll be quick. The gentleman took a lot of time with yes. this. Yes. My name is Brecken Satchwell. I'm a hobbyist writer and photographer up here in Canada. I listen to the podcast and appreciate your take on Tika rifles. And thank you. Um, I've got Mark now, too. Uh, I also appreciate how you and the other hosts, Mark and Jim, bring the world of firearms and shooting sports to the everyday user. I've learned a lot over the, or from the podcast over the years, and I find it a great tool for information. I'm not sure if these items are of interest to you. However, I thought you might enjoy the read. I've included a copy of the Canadian Firearms Journal. I have two articles in it that you might like. One is a Canadian supplier of Tika magazines, NDR shooting supplies. They make quite the magazine that I run flawlessly in my switch barrel rifles. This guy is singing my song twice. <laughs> Tika's switch barrel rifles. Uh, I believe they have just started shipping to the U.S. Brecken writes. Second is a Tika switch barrel article that I wrote uh, that was partially started thanks to yourself and the podcast crew. The concept of such a rifle was something I researched thanks to the team and it helped me create a cool rifle. I run a T3X with barrels in 6.5 PRC and 3.38 RCM. Brilliant combination, thank mm. you. Uh, working on a 300 RCM now. I also run a 6.5 by 55 Swede barrel. You know, like that uh, on it as well uh, until I get another action going. Uh, as a thank you for the information that you and your team have provided, I wanted to send you a copy of the cartridge calendar I made up for 2024. Oh, that's Look cool. Look at that. Yes. I figured it would be good addition to the podcast or reloading room, and it will be, Yes. Uh, I only make so many a year, but usually have a few extras. If we need one, let me know. Um, I feel like we made the short list. Can we take a peek yeah. at the, the what's in there? Like um, what's so? Oh, nice. January, the biggest, the baddest, the 460 Weatherby Magnum. Start your year off right. Which is which is the <laughs> largest bore diameter in the Weatherby cartridge lineup. Oh man! Um, having fired it, I can tell you that it is a handful. It looks handful. like you can anchor a boat with that thing. You can yes. anchor anything you want with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you can sink a boat with it. The, yeah. the PS at the bottom I like the most uh, because I appreciate and identify with this. PS, I type this out because my handwriting is atrocious. Reckon I understand. Um, so, this is really neat. Canadian Firearms Journal. I love the fact, and I tell people this all the time that write in, uh, especially international folks. I love the fact that we have. A, a tool at our disposal now via this podcast that we can communicate with people across the globe in, in like real time. It's truly mm. astounding. And even if there's a massive language barrier, and this is something that's kind of come to me over the past couple of years, I, I've talked with people in uh, on every continent that hunting is allowed or shooting is allowed. 
And I, I'm, I realize that even though there's a language barrier, and, and I don't speak theirs and they don't speak mine necessarily, and I have to use Google Translate to understand what they're saying, we as hunters and shooters collectively are on the same playing field with everything that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And that I can be sitting around the fire on the steps of Mongolia with the golden eagle hunters and depicting with lines in the sand and hand gestures and, and facial expressions, we can go over our triumphs and failures and know exactly what we're talking about despite not having the same language. I mean, it's so true. You see that on, uh, on you know, international hunting videos. People, they do not speak, you no. know, a lick of the same tongue. Yeah. And yet their communication, because they are both hunters, yes. they can, mm -hmm. you know, coordinate a, you know, somewhat complex Absolutely. Taking thing. part in the second oldest human tradition. Uh, What's the first? Well. Oh, dear. Um, here we are. <laughs> Playing catch one, up. One species. Let's go to Mongolia. <laughs> I want to so I'm gonna, bad. I'm going to book that eagle hunt. I would love, fun. Sounds I'll, good. I'll tell you, Tibetan fox, that's one I want. Uh, they're a cool looking critter. And then, of course, if you could if you could ever get yourself the Marco Polo, that would be whew, chills. They're would you hunt either of those with a 357 Remington Maximal? Uh, I would say that the Tibetan fox would be the better play. Sure. Um, not that a 357 Max wouldn't kill a Marco. I just think that the um, opportunity for distance comes yep. into play. Mm -hmm. Marco being what they are. I forgot another extra to this podcast, too. There's so many extras, it's yeah. hard to keep them straight. This is also like a really cool gun highlight video. So we've got really cool cartridge, really cool gun highlight, an awesome listener letter, which I will point out. Thank you, everybody that writes in, whether it's a comment on one of our videos. We do read them all, we, and I admittedly am not good about like responding or acknowledging but please know like we read them they're very important to us we get ideas from them uh they warm our hearts so i just want everybody to to know that um so yeah cool gun cool cartridge and super cool ian yeah who's gonna tell us all about it ian clem what came first ian the cartridge or the gun for you uh for me it was an introduction to the cartridge so uh, like 16 year old Ian going to the range, the local range, like tons of, uh, sessions, uh, before and after, um, this older gentleman, uh, actually kind of looked like a off duty Santa Claus type. He pulls something out of his <laughs> red velvet set. No, it was like a, there's Cordero one in every bag. range. Yeah. And, and it was, um, it was a Dan Wesson revolver. Oh Yeah. And I watched him shoot, and I was just floored by the the flame coming out the end, the flame coming out the cylinder gap, uh, what the bowling pins were doing, you know, downrange. And it was just like, holy cow, what is this really? And it was one of those, you know, high polish blue, um, six inch barrel type jobs, and it just was really impressive experience. And so I mustered up kind of courage and, and asked him about it, and he and he told me, well, this one is a little interesting. This one's a 357 maximum. And being the snot-nosed, know-it-all kid that I was, I wanted to correct him because no one in my little town knew more about guns than me, right? So I said, well, I think you meant 357 Magnum, sir. Oh, boy. <laughs> and with a little twinkle in his eye, you know, he kind of smiled and said, no, it's called a 357 maximum. And I had no idea. I'd never heard of that before. And I got introduced to something for the first time. And the whole drive home, I remember thinking to myself, like, really neat cartridge, but uh, it's like a carbine cartridge that he's trying to shoot out of a handgun. This, this would be really, really good in a rifle. So then fast forward 20 years, actually, um, after graduating, moved out east and wanted a new hobby. I was into machining, making parts for motorcycles, so I decided to start, like, home gunsmithing, hobby gunsmithing um, on my own. And this was actually the first project that I ever did. And um, so it's a Ruger number one. Uh, the people watching will re recognize that. But it's kind of a special one. Back in 1983, Ruger did a limited edition, and it was to commemorate 50 years of the California Highway Patrol. So you'll see the, the roll stamp there that, that has their insignia. And they only made like three or 400 of these. And they might have even paired it with a Blackhawk, both in 357 Magnum. Um, well, I came across this one on Gunbroker, and... To the seller's credit, he was real honest about it. He said, hey, whoever had this, I don't know if it's ever been shot, but it was stored muzzle down on probably a wet, damp basement floor, and the first inch of the barrel is gone. It's just like, you know, it's orange and pitted and, and horrible. 
So it was a, a Ruger number one A, which that configuration is a 22 inch barrel, Alexander Henry four end, the one you usually see in, in magazine articles. Well, I said, you know, let me grab this for a steal of a price. It was like $400, believe it or not. And now, come to find out, it's one of the rarest number ones, but its collector value is already kind of gone. So I cut two inches off the barrel, recrowned it, put a new um, factory Ruger uh, sight on it, um, a new uh, foreign end cap, and fitted that all up. And then I just said, you know what? It's already sort of modified. I'm going to rent one of these reamers from a reamer rental place for like $40. And I actually extended the chamber in it, which was 357 Magnum. I pushed it out three tenths of an inch and created a 357 Maximum. Longer case, but same base of the, of the case dimension is the same. And it's you know true straight wall, no taper to it at all. So didn't have to contend with any of that. I just pushed the chamber out to the, uh, to the Maximum designation. And uh, now I have a Ruger number one RSI. I traded a guy online. He wanted the short forend. I wanted the long forend because I was shortening the barrel. So now I have a Ruger number one RSI uh, in 357 maximum. And the one thing that kind of gives it away, you can tell it used to be the longer barreled version, is this is the barrel band front sling swivel. And you can see I just had to inlet that into the forend. Um, but it turned out to be kind of a neat rifle, and since it was my first project, I couldn't bring myself to ever trade or sell it, so I still have it. And uh, I've been shooting the 357 Maximum ever since. Yeah, it's super cool. Gun is so, so great. So would it have, would a Ruger number one have come with this length of barrel, with this forend and everything, where it where it, it terminates right near the muzzle? Like I, Yes. So that's this, such a good look. It's a, it, it's a, so it's a nice. offering, I think, that they still maybe make if it hasn't been discontinued. Uh, super limited distribution. Okay. As with all number ones now. Yeah. yeah. They called it the number one international or RSI. Hmm. Um, and it was, back in the day, they chambered them in all sorts of, you know, um, 7 by 57 um, a lot of European cartridges for this type of configuration. But it's been a real handy, handy rifle. And... You know, obviously, I was going to hand load the cartridge and see what I could bring out of it. Um, so we've got a couple, uh, a couple representative pieces of ammunition here. One is a, is a factory load, and this looks pretty vintage, doesn't it? I don't know. I'd oh yeah. Like oh yeah. Late '80s, something like that. Well, we're, green, let, tell green tell us. Uh, so I'll, I'm going to say a couple things here. So we decided to do this cartridge. Ian has it, of course. Uh, he drops these things off at my desk. Tells me a lot of these things that he just told us. He goes, all right, well, see you later. Have a good podcast. I'm like, you think you're going to let me know, number one, that you have these things, say these things, and expect that we're not going to drag you into the room? <laughs> like, uh, that's a, that's a non-starter. I was trying to stack the deck for knowledge in, in your corner, Mark, so that you could kind of, like, come in here and, like, be an authoritative source of information and, and, and sort of, I don't know. Just rattling off facts. Yeah. I would have, I would have like bought a pair of glasses with like non-corrective lenses and just, <laughs> my, I'd have had to go the whole nine yards on them just to, you know, actually, um, where did you, uh, tell that box of factory ammo, where'd you get that? So this was at a local, a mom and pop store, a hardware store in my hometown, Baraboo, Wisconsin, Eisenberg's It's now out of business, but it was kind of one of those things where like, you go to the back room and you kind of move all the bird feeders and old bird seed out of the way. And there's a mogwai in the corner that you could buy if you're really interested. <laughs> and, then, and then there's this, <laughs> and then there's, there was this. That and one I, caught me off guard. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'm sure it was something ridiculous, like six eighty nine, you know, for a box of 20. My um, gut tells me that that was actually more rare than the mogwai. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Did That's you get so the Mogwai? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, no. I snack late, so it wouldn't have worked out. <laughs> I understand. Um, but no, so yeah, I, I held on to this box of ammo, but I never shot any until like a couple months ago. Um, actually, a coworker of mine wanted to see what they were like, so I let him shoot. Um, I still haven't shot any of these. I think he shot one or two rounds out of it. But um, but yeah, I, I just started. You know, I found some brass, and it, you know, it was on off to the races. Where? Did you find some brass? So, um, like, when 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 did this thing this? sort of fall into the obscurity that it lies in now? Almost immediately. So, yeah, I I think you can get a Dan Wesson because that was in three sixty, 
before even. Yes. Yeah, that's right. And then I think there may have been a Ruger Blackhawk or Super Blackhawk that was factory chambered in it. I think, in fact, I think that was sort of the introductory gun. Yes. Yeah. And then almost immediately it just vanished. Hmm. So, uh, Mark, what's the year on your printout there? So, coincidentally, what I have in my notes here is 1983. Which is kind of cool because oh, that's same the year the, uh, of the of the of gun the gun, itself. Yeah, yep. yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it says uh, let's see, Remington Arms Company and Ruger in 1983 as a new chambering for the Ruger Blackhawk. Shortly thereafter, Dan Wesson Farms and Thompson Center Arms introduced firearms in this cartridge. Um, de- 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 some other stuff, but yeah. And and then almost immediately it was just off the landscape because it is. It's it's bizarre, right? So that was a time. It was a little bit later when the Magnum revolver craze kicked off, right? So that we'll credit Dirty Harry movies for, um, which predate that a bit. But Magnum revolvers were a thing. I mean, they were hot to trot. Ruger had some really eclectic stuff at the time. They made a gun called the Hawkeye, which just is not a Magnum revolver. It's not even really a revolver. It looks like a revolver, but it's a single shot revolver, sort of, chambered in what's called 256 Winchester which is this goofy little varmint cartridge um, based off the 357 Magnum. It was a single-shot pistol. And, and Ruger is still to this day notorious for making these weird runs of guns in unusual calibers or, or making a caliber, like bringing it to light, right? Mm-hmm. And they're, they're usually like very special edition. They last for a short amount of time, and then they fade into obscurity, and the collector value goes bananas. Yeah. Like bananas. Who wouldn't want a 357 Magnum with just more? Exactly. And because 357 Mag is a good cartridge, but it's not a great cartridge. It's on the threshold of functional as a hunting cartridge, in my opinion, in a, in a revolver. Um, in a carbine, it gets a little bit more. Um, you still have the flexibility of being able to shoot a variety of 38 cartridges through it. Um, but it's, it's like almost there. The maximum definitely takes it there and it's funny because i look there's this new cartridge out called 360 buckhammer mm-hmm. good name if you hold the picture up next to 357 maximum and corporate wants to know what the difference between these two pictures are they're the same picture mm. it's a rebranded 357 max it's different enough but it's effectively the same thing well ian and i were talking the other day and made or he made a very similar correlation with the three, uh, the three fifty legend. Sure, yeah, not yeah. too different. No, not too different. And yeah. I mean, go because go over. Or maybe you both can, but Ian, go over some of those numbers because it's to me it sounded like oh, this was the original three fifty legend, but just a, maybe a little bit better or sooner at least. Or, yeah. Um. So everyone's kind of familiar with what a three fifty seven mag brings to the table, and you know if you own one, you've probably tried shooting thirty eight specials through it just for for practice, right? It's a convenient mm-hmm. thing to do. Less recoil and report. Well, the difference between those two cartridges, um, you could say, is like four hundred feet per second. You know, from the thirty eight special to the to the magnum. Well, the magnum to the maximum is is kind of continuing that trend, you know, add three-tenths of an inch in length to the case, but now you're getting another 600 feet per second over the magnum. So that's, you know, we, we talk about these cartridges and we've, we've got an embarrassment of riches of cartridges to choose from, and we're trying to decide whether rebarreling a, our favorite hunting rifle is worth it for another 150 feet per second sometimes. This is 600 feet per second more out of a, out of a rifle. So what I ended up with for a load... I'm looking at my note here, and it's uh, it's kind of approaching 35 Remington um, ballistics, and that so. that's the sweet that's the sweet thing about it. In in a carbine, it's like a 35 Remington, which is people herald as a phenomenal intermediate size game cartridge and like a quote brush cartridge. Right. Well, look at this thing. Yeah, I mean well, it's it's well, cute. It is. Yeah, it, it is. It is. Um. So, so it's cute in a way like it's trying to not be cute. Yeah. Like you look at it and you're like, oh, it wants to not be cute, but it still is a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> like a toddler kind of like trying to, you know, be like their parents or something like that. Or yeah. maybe like, oh, the, they're giving it their best. The, yeah. Its the, performance isn't cute. No. No. I wouldn't want to get hit with one. <laughs> the Tacoma with a two inch lift kit or something like that. <laughs> you got Ian going on hey, Tacoma hey, jokes. Hey, nice. Hey, All right. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, I ended up. 
with a 180 grain bullet, and we'll talk about the bullet maybe a little bit later, but 180 grain bullet uh, at 2180 feet per second. So look up, look up, you know, published data for the 350 Legend, and I think we're talking 180 at 2100. Yeah. So and the 35s of wow. 200 usually at about 2200. Yeah. So it's on the on the heels of a 35 Remington. Well, and also the at least the leg, 350 Legend cartridges that we tested here were 170 grainers, and this is a 180, mm-hmm. doing a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, so to me, this is going to be a little bit controversial, and I admit I'm probably in the minority here, but for as many youth hunters, like first time hunters. They get handed a 243, which is a great cartridge, and, and it's got a lot of attributes um, that I admire. But I almost would trade, you know, a little bit of um, frontal area um, and a little less recoil. I'd trade range for frontal area. Oh, if I was, yes. You know what I mean? Oh, if I was, mm-hmm. if I was I, and, I've, and I've exposed one young person in my life to this cartridge, and it was a really chill session where we were shooting chunks of 2x4, and we started out with a 38 Special and then a 357 Magnum, and then in the same session, you know, a handful of each, 357 Maximum, and he had a ball, and he was, and, he, you know, he wasn't afraid of the... Re- I think what it is with something like this is... It's got less recoil velocity, so sure. it's less shocking to the to the yeah. you know smaller statured and 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 younger hunters. So I think it's a, a really good kind of like entry point into uh, medium game hunting for for a lot of people if you're willing to s- consider it like you know a 200 yard cartridge. Which sure, is. that's really cool. Which you think of what most game animals get shot at, like the types of distances, the type of terrain. Yep. Oftentimes, intentionally putting yourself in a spot where you're not, you're not even going to get that longer shot. Like a lot, it's going to be inside of 100 yards, likely. Yep. I mean, perfect. Yeah, yeah. So it it's it's a fun one to play with. Um, it's a delight to shoot. Um, it has that sort of slow, heavy recoil, you know. But it, we're talking about a 223 case capacity genre here, so it's you're not going to get crazy recoil no matter what you load in it. Um, Actually, you can get really good quality brass today from Starline. Um, so, you know, it is it is a lead balloon, I admit, but, you know, it's hanging on by yeah. the skin of its teeth. The, there, there are, is a whole slew of enthusiasts out there, um, whether it's silhouette or handgun hunters especially, that appreciate the maximum and other cartridges like it. And there are a few extendo rimmed magnum revolver cases that have come out uh, on the scene. You're one of two people I know that hunts and actively uses 357 Max. Um, the other one, a friend of mine, uh, he and I hunt pronghorn every year. Um, and he's carried a 357 Max. And then this year he carried a 414 Super Mag, which is the oh, 41 Rem Mag with the maximum treatment. So it's oh, wow. slightly longer. Um, here again, a converted Rugers okay. predominantly uh, that he's using. And um, yeah, Starline is, God bless you guys for making the hard to find yeah. brass cases. Yep. I mean, in, in, in kind of now obscure cartridges, which is a shame, but they're, they're cranking them out. It's fantastic brass, great stuff. Um, and what a versatile little gun. So you were shooting 38 special out of the same gun. Oh yeah. yeah. Yep. Wait, Oh, out of this gun, you can do the whole, yes, sir. Three yep. seven Magnum 38 special thing as well. You could shoot, what is it? 38 short, yeah, short Colt, long Colts. Yep. So, oh and, gosh. and they, and they just littlest, Slightly larger, yep. slightly larger, 38 special, 357, 357. Why didn't it just take over for the 357 Magnum if you can Wait, also shoot? It's a good question, and I read, I didn't talk to anyone who had this this experience, but I read that um, because it was the fastest of the family, people want to see, well, how fast can we get it? Oh, so they started yeah. loading 100 grain, 110 grain, maybe 125. Flame I heard that the top strap of those black blackhawks was taking a beating and you start seeing evidence of flame cutting up there and then uh advanced erosion maybe of the forcing cone too um and that scared a lot of people off and they thought yeah. well okay this was a mistake let's let's yeah. abandon this what's what's crazy to me is if you look at cartridges like 460 smith and wesson it's the same thing just scaled up right. so 460 smith and wesson if we go back Starts at like 45 Long Colt, which then got turned into 454 Casual, which then got turned into 460 Smith and Wesson, um, and like you, you don't really see anybody hunting with a Casual anymore. Not that it's not a fine cartridge. Everybody's running 460, 
that's getting into that kind of gun for the most part. There's still a lot of freedom freedoms arms owners out there that are shooting four fifty fours. But um, yeah, why that didn't like come back or just stay hooked up, and especially w- with the notion that it could be put into a lever gun. Right. See, yeah. I think if that would have been the vanguard yeah. entry into the market, a yeah. lever gun, I think we'd be talking differently today. Yeah, and I, feel and like and I wonder. Too. I wouldn't have bothered. I like. I love my three G seven Magnum Henry. Yeah. And I got it threaded, and I'll say this: when I shoot thirty eight specials out of it too, it's the quietest gun I've ever shot. Like it, I think it's quieter than some twenty twos. Oh, sure. Wow. And it's you know it's unbelievable. But just the fact, I, and I got it knowing. That it was flexible. Oh, 38's when I want. 357 Magnums when I want. So in this it's one, lever does, gun. This so one cool. will do three different oh, cartridges. No, no it'll do one, two, three, four, five, six. Gosh, that's you have so six cool. guns. You just you have six guns in one. Yeah. yeah. If you can find that 360 Dan Weston, yeah. that's kind of a rare yeah. bird. But I mean, I'm just I'm I'm gonna count it. But I mean, you. You advertise this thing. I mean, it's, this is a mark. This is a marketing problem. <laughs> you advertise it's six guns in one. Yeah. No changing of barrels. From rabbits to may, reindeer. From rabbits to reindeer. That's what it'll be called. Yeah. yeah. Well, so until like this week, no one had brought this up to me in a really, really long time, and I wonder if it's not that straight wall, you know, hunting yeah. Sure. trend yeah. that's going up. What uh, that three hundred and sixty buck thumper or whatever yeah. it is that does that. That that is not part of the fam. It can't do the same it, thing. It is not. We, no, it's it's because you said it's really close, but it's, it's close. not exact. It, it's an appreciably more powerful cartridge, along the same lines. Okay, right. Got it. Um, so back on the lever guns, I I speculate like the case would be just a little too long for like an eighteen ninety four Marlin, but then it would be pretty short for like a three thirty six. And so maybe it didn't get levered because you'd end up like carrying a full size 336 in a cartridge that emulated 35 Remington ballistics and at that time was still a, a mainline offering. And we'd have to ask like, okay, what is the potentially subjective advantage to a 357 Max in that gun other than you could shoot 38 specials out of it? comparatively to like a, a 35 Remington, which would give you a little bit more mass on a factory loaded option. But if, if somebody could make an 1894 feed one of these things reliably, boy, that would be, that'd be pretty It'd be special. over. It'd be pretty wild. That would be neat. Be, well, I'm looking to you, Wyoming arms. <laughs> yeah. Ian, uh, you mentioned something before. I was going to see if you might be able to shed some light on it. Flame cutting. Yeah. What what's going on there? What is that effect? Uh, I don't know if you've ever played with like a plasma cutter in shop class or anything like that. But I didn't. No. Yeah, it's, they, it's uh, he, did, would, he did a lot of they wouldn't like, let him theater. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's essentially <laughs> what you're dealing with during a ballistic event. You're you're that's creating weird. plasma, right? And uh, you know you can cut steel with it um, yeah. if you if it's concentrated and focused. So the more you know high pressure um, and temperature you know gas you have to contend with. Um, you know, the more propensity you have to erode steel quicker. Okay. Um, so sure. that's basically, uh, yeah, they, they call it, for whether it's technically flame cutting or not, um, you know, that's what's going on. Gotcha. Can I draw you a picture of how and where? Uh, sure. Yeah, all the good, Could cool I kids were in drama club, by the way, Ryan. Were so, they? Yeah. That's interesting. So Not at my school. On the wheel guns, you'd have your top strap here above the cylinder. Mm-hmm. And then that turns into your barrel okay so then you have a little bit of barrel that comes out and then you have this gap between the face of your cylinder mm-hmm. and the barrel oh okay. and then as that gas leaches out it begins to erode right here very in a con- oh, very concentrated okay. little spot sure, just yeah psh- so then your you know your rear sight would be here and then your hammer spur gotcha very nice drawing right yeah fantastic, no sweat. by the way if if you look at some of like the scandium frame smith and wessons mm-hmm. um in like 357, so it would be... Wait, what are you going to say about them? <laughs> I'm going to say all good things other than they're atrocious to shoot, and I know that you love subjecting yourself to that kind of punishment. I do love it. Um, if you look at that, so that top strap there, they have this little piece of steel flashing, and it looks like a, oh, ro- yeah. it looks like a roll pin almost all the way unrolled. And so the, that steel flashing kind of hooks in there and then goes like that. Yep. And all that does is prevent that the jetting. the of the yeah. stuff, yeah. Yep. 
Interesting. Because um, that frame, scandium, whatever that alloy is a mix of, um, would not survive. Yeah. Can I bother us to go back to the Ruger number one? Please. For a moment? So, like, talk a little bit, Ian and Ryan. I've I've never actually fired a Ruger number one, but it's always been one of those, like, dream guns, you know, just sort of like, uh, I don't even actually know when I became aware of its existence. I almost wonder if it was like, if it's like born into every American child that you're just like be. aware of the Ruger number one, even if you don't actually see one or whatever. But what is so special about it? Like, just talk, talk a little bit about like, why is it such a special thing? Well, for me personally, uh, it's the first um, centerfire rifle I ever shot. So dad's um, engagement present for my mom was a uh, Ruger number one. Um, God bless America. Number one A in uh, <laughs> 270. And um, it was, uh, you know, one of the first ones off the line, like 1966, something like that. And oh. It was uh, the first gun I ever, the first centerfire I ever shot. And for me, dad recognized that I have a left master eye, even though I'm right-handed. So he taught me to shoot left-handed. And his number one was you know, pretty, pretty akin to teaching his left okay. eye kid to shoot because top tank safety, ambi, lever, ambi. You could argue that maybe loading might be just a little bit hampered because the sidewall on the receiver is kind of higher on the left side, but, you know, kids are flexible uh, and adaptable. And it was, um, I romanticize it now because of that personal experience. Can I goof with it here? Yep, yep. If I hadn't had that personal experience, um, I might not be kind of the single shot um, junkie that I am now, and and I have you know a growing collection of single shot rifles because of that. But um, yeah, I think I've heard it say that the Ruger number one is you know the probably the most elegant mass produced rifle made in in the states, and um, you know the the Browning single shot guys would probably argue that, and they'd have some good some good points, but. Um, taking some design cues from John Farkason, uh back in the day, I think he did. Bill Ruger did him justice as sort of a tip oh, of the hat to yeah. that to that style. They're so pretty, and they just like just running that lever. It just feels so like such a nice bit of just mechanical things working in harmony. I just yep. really, really like. I mean, that's why I like all all guns with a lever for whatever reason feel much more. Uh, there's just like more cool mechanical things going on for me than a bolt gun it's almost like one of those uh rube goldberg type things like you do a lever and then like some things happen and then another thing happens over here it's just it's cool yeah well it's such a svelte package it is so yeah but nothing it's still stick, nothing hanging off the side at all just it exudes strength when you see this massive reach block slide down out right? of the, you right. know it's like i've got a mini cannon you know for me i could just sit here and just do this all day I just wouldn't even leave. I'd be totally content. Much the same thing, but I started reading about, um, you know, early 1900s African horn and ivory hunters and then uh, started getting catalogs from Merkel and Blaser mm. and started looking at old. My grandmother was born in, in Hungary and was still much alive when I was figuring out how guns worked and, and hunting and became enamored with European rifles. And, um, you know, when you're eight... And you're like, well, how much does a Blazer K95 cost? And you're like, that's more than a house uh, <laughs> to the to the casual eight year old. Um, the Ruger number one filled that void. And as I continued getting more and more enamored with guns, I remember I had the biggest crush on Brittany Boddington growing mm. up, and she killed a Cape Buffalo with a number one chambered in 405 Winchester. And I re I remembered the the picture in the magazine, and I thought I'm gonna own a Ruger number one. And that that was it. You can you can buy That's how you'll get her. one that has her namesake <laughs> on it as part of the Boddington Limited Edition Ruger Number One series. They have. Are you it, familiar? Well, so I sold the original set yep. that were were Craig's gun. So it was a seven by fifty seven three hundred Holland and Holland. Uh, was there a nine three in there? Nine three by seventy four R. Yeah, the Leopard. Yep. They all had like a game animal associated with them. And then four fifty four hundred Nitro, and then four fifty Nitro. Yeah, and I sold the Dickens out of those things. Yeah, and well, it's neat because they had like a satin yeah. mat, you know, yep. uh, bluing to them. They had uh, they had the right Caucus Mountain on them. Um, walnut. Yeah, uh, on them. Uh, they're kind of a neat little limited edition. They're, they're the loveliest number one ever built. Yeah, I I think uh, other than <clears throat> if you could find an RSI stainless, 
Mm. That's a pretty special gun. You like that Ooh. one? Yeah, they're they're pretty nifty. And a 1A stainless. Um, I sold a, a number of RSI stainlesses, took them for granted, and said, ah, I'll just pick one up later. And they were in like 257 Roberts and 757 sure, sure. and 65 Swede. And, yep, there's another one that got away. Um, I did get one. I, I have a very uh, tumultuous relationship with it because, unfortunately, I got one of them that doesn't shoot. And so it's it's uh, that in itself is a lead balloon. Um, I'll figure that one out. I, I, have, I haven't relinquished it to gun broker yet. I want to love it. Yeah, the, mm-hmm. the analogy for, for the car guy, again, would be like a um, – you know, a classic MG or Triumph uh, British car with the Lucas Electrics where you want to love it, but uh, sometimes it uh, leaves you a little bit high and dry every once in a while. So it's, it's a little bit of a crapshoot. This one happens to shoot real well. I've had uh, three or four of them over the years, and it's been about 50-50 for me. I don't yeah. know what your experience 50, is. 50-50. Oh, is that kind of yeah. how it yeah. goes? Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Boy, it seems like that kind of like wouldn't be the case because there's just so little to... So I mean, little that you can see. So little, yeah. I was going to say that <laughs> That's because there's a lot going on there. But it looks, like I said, so svelte, so simple. You're like, oh, a single shot. How could there be? You, know, you pull um, that forehand off and you go, what? <laughs> yeah. Is this a clock? It's like the game of mousetrap. That's the way it looks when you take the furniture off. Yeah. Jeez. Springs and levers and, yeah. There was it's, a, it's funny hearing you guys talk about, like, you know, like, oh, man, like, even as a kid, like, I love this thing because for me, as a kid, like pump gun, good, auto, better. You've got a bolt action. You're gonna be way too slow, bud. Yeah. And then now, obviously, like over time, it's like I, I, I use predominantly s- bolt guns. I took a hard left turn um, on single shot rifles, and I went through an encore phase. Oh sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm okay publicly talking about that now. I um, killed an antelope with a uh, encore and 270. You know, I had these dreams. I'm going to have a frame and 30 barrels and furniture. I'm going to, it's going to be a pistol. It's going to be a rifle. It's going to be a shotgun. It's going to be a muzzleloader. You know what you end up with? A frame for every barrel. Yeah. Yes. And um, yeah. so I went, I went down that road before I, I finally pulled the trigger on a number one. And I had to wait until Ruger, because they, they went from like a regularly produced arm um, in a smattering of calibers to one caliber a year one style so there's a lot of number ones there's one a's one b's one a b's one s one v one t um, one h oh yep one h uh heavy tropical right yep, yep. oh and, and that's mine yeah like they're, they're really neat they're cool and you get them in cool cartridges does the barrel have a little funny little like no <laughs> <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the looking thing nah that's a that's custom shop when probably. i hear tropical i think of those funny looking yeah like leave like your laser boresight tool in there yeah and you can mm. do that mod yeah yeah right. it's funny though brian you look at you're like oh yeah i'm gonna have you know one gun be you know multiple guns yeah. which in theory at first you're like yeah that's a great idea until you like try till you, till you monkey in with practice and yeah. like, wait a minute it doesn't happen this one maybe not just but this, this cartridge yeah Sort yeah, of. It's six guns and one. That's that's true. It's, it's six, six for, guns and one. I know, six I, for the price I, of one. I readily admit that this is like, it's efficient, and you can you can definitely fill your freezer with it. Um, it's if I had a Marco Polo hunt or some sort of like lifetime hunt, you know, well, it's obviously this is a fun a sure. fun cartridge. Yeah. Of all the of all the fun you know cartridges that people either make excuses for or just right off to goofing around with or something like that. This is the one that actually has the most practicality attached to it. And Mm -hmm. that could not be overstated now. There's a lot of people who will go out and get stuff that's like, ah, I know it's not that, you know, whatever. But it's like you get this thing and you can have that goofing around fun, but then you actually can use it effectively as well. And so, like, that's, that's actually hard to find. I know it. And nowadays with straight wall, as crazy as it is, and a resurgence in lever guns, and a resurgence in cramming the most that you can into a small and efficient package in these guns. And I, my hat tip is to the 350 Legend um, as an example. Like, how isn't this now reintroducing 357 Remington Maximum? Maybe we just did. I hope so. I hope so. Of all the quotation mark lead balloons that we've talked about, and, and a lot of them, you know, they have merit, or maybe at the time they made sense, and you can see why it faded into obscurity. This is one where I'm like, 
Bring it back. Yeah. <laughs> Bring it back. Yeah. 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 You know what I think you're going to find the more of those that we talk about, which hopefully we talk about. And if you want to hear more lead balloons, oh my. <laughs> you make sure you drop lead balloons in the comments below so Mark sees it and is mm-hmm. an ever present reminder. Mm-hmm. I bet the ones that we're going to talk about the most are the 30 to 35 caliber projectiles in modest cartridges mm-hmm. that do exceptional work, like 338 Federal, 358 Winchester. Mm-hmm. Um, it's that, a it, That's a funny area. Yeah. They Wait, just, we, when we do our podcast idea about calibers, yep. well, it, it'll be interesting when we dive into that 30 to 35 range. Yep. That's a very sweet spot and not in a big bone crushing magnum, mm-hmm. which f- for what this is, it is a big bone crushing magnum I'm sure. in, in, I, its, yeah. in its uh, proper capacities. But uh, what I'm, I'm thinking like modest recoiling, very efficient, effective game stoppers. For, I, I totally would have gotten this when um, I got our uh, I got our ten month old her first gun already. I got it when she was three months old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a three fifty seven Magnum lever gun that I just happen to be playing with for the time being. Breaking it in, right? Yeah, yeah. Got to make sure it's safe. Breaking it in, but I would have gotten this instead. But you can't, not yet. <sighs> no, I know. No, I know it. You know what you need? You need a Ruger number three. Okay. Not Actually, one, I'm three. not familiar with that one. Three's the key There's number. something I've always wanted to do, and that is to take a fairly accessible side-by-side shotgun, like a, oh, yes. a Hooglu yes. or a, a CZ yes. ring neck. He knows where I'm going. Oh, yes, I and do. Then, and then actually um, line those bores. You know, they got close uh, center-to-center access, and it would be perfect for something like this. Can you picture How like hard a miniature double rifle in 357 maximum? How h- this is not a hard project. Ryan says it's pretty easy. Yeah, I think sounds, we should. I think we should do a series fun. where Ryan builds it. We have a customer. <laughs> <laughs> we have a customer that comes. Then we'll in just here. like keep cutting in the part where he says, "This is easy." Hear, <laughs> hear me out. We have a customer that comes in here that will buy every JP Sauer hammer gun he can find, relines them. Um, he built this fascinating regulator block for the muzzles. It's ugly, but it's functional. Um, high temp braises it on there, and then it's got multi-axis adjustment on it, and he. Rechambers him to 338 Marlin Express. Oh, neat. And he's like, that is the ticket. And he does the double gun shoot at Winnequa with it. Does he? But he hunts deer with him too. Oh, that's cool. And so he pulls out, and they weigh like 14 pounds because he's got like, he gets 16s or 12s. Oh, see, I would give a 28 gauge yep. for that. Yeah. Yep. Oh, that'd be so cool. And he uh, he pulls it out, and it's got a period correct optic on it too. It's got sound like a claw mount, a tip off. Yeah. You know? And it's a J.P. Sauer double hammer. That's cool. In 338 Marlin Express. And it's like, okay. <laughs> That's pretty neat. Yeah. That yeah. is super neat. Guys, this was a fun one. It was a good one. Yeah. I can't think mm. of a better way to cap off our holiday cartridge talks. Yeah. Nope. Can't think of one. Ian, did we miss anything? I no, think- I just appreciate the invite. And, oh, my um, gosh. It's a it's a fun cartridge, and um, yeah, Merry Christmas. I'd say it was less of an invite and more of a, no, you are you're coming like i don't care if you don't want to which i know you wanted to but it oh, wasn't an option this is a this is a trigger from austria they don't make it anymore from austria yeah oh um, my gosh actually you have to ian talk through this because you showed this to me well it's it's this neat uh trigger it's a single set trigger but it's one of those that you push forward to set so try just the hunting weight um go ahead and dry fire it uh, without setting it and it's a uh, just right now right yep yep and it's a, um, it's a pretty very, crisp, oh, very you nice. know, like two pound, two and very a quarter. Very clean, maybe. not a bunch of garbage going on there. Did you, did you have to goof? Well, no, this is, this is a trigger from Austria. You yep. didn't have to goof with it. You just nope, just installed. And now cock it again. There you go. And now set it by pushing on the back of the trigger forward. You'll see it sort of hyperextend. There you go. Sure. And then try it again. Try not to pull it. <laughs> try to use the force to get the sear. I'm gonna just like force. try and. It's not that light. It's not oh, that okay. light. It's maybe four ounces. <laughs> it yeah. is that light. It's, <laughs> maybe, it's maybe four ounces. Uh, it's, I mean, if a bug would have landed on it, would have beat me to it. Yeah, that's Keplinger. That's so cool. Keplinger was the name, um, and it's a really neat part of that rifle too. Mark, play with that. It's just. Oh, ju- it's just in it, general. Have you, very, you have did you done that. No. Like to begin with, it's a very nice trigger. Yeah. 
set triggers and stuff. That's uh. It just seems like you should do sophisticated things with this rifle. You should do sophisticated things with it. You should you should wear tweed and crawl on your hands and knees and you know just shoot something fifty feet away. You don't gotta <laughs> convince me. Uh, okay, I think I think that's it. Uh, the three fifty. Right ten minutes. Yeah, exactly. The screen's gone black. Funny how that, that works. That means we're on time. Uh, the three fifty seven Remington Maximum. Ian, thank you for joining us for for having this, bringing it in, telling us the story about it. Really cool cartridge. Let's bring it back. If you agree, comment below. Bring it back. <sighs> Let's do this together, everybody. Thanks for listening. Happy holidays. We'll catch you on the next one. See ya. Bye.